Is that the traditional method is when you sit a child at a high chair and you have your food ready and you provide them a spoonful, spoon, spoons full, that's how you say it, of food and you let them, you know, eat it or not, taste it or not, and so on. And so I showed you an example in one of the last lectures where, where my grandson was given carrots, right? And he could try for them. And then when he stopped trying for them, then, then they, they let go, but they were spoon feeding him. Okay, so spoon feeding is traditional. And, you know, my generation grew up with our, you know, spoon being spoon fed, whether it's homemade food or, you know, baby food bottles or whatever. So they would, they would spoon feed it to you. So the kids learned to put their mouth around the spoon, hold their head up, control what they want, and then turn their face away if they don't want anymore. So that's part of that responsive parenting. And then if they, so you just stop when they want to stop. And then if they still want to eat, you let them eat as much as they want. This is already part of it too. You don't look at a child and go, you know, you're, I think you're too pudgy for a 10 year old, 10 month old. So, so I'm going to determine, you know, I think you should only have one bucket of butternut squash or whatever. You don't do that at all. You let a child eat until they're full. And what they learn from this is when they're hungry, they get food, they get to decide when they're full, and then you respect that. So then there's not a battle around how much do I eat, what do I eat? It all has to do with, well, I feel like eating this. And so you'll never be able to control a child's diet throughout their entire life because they're, they're an autonomous human being. So these are the early on you're teaching them proactively and, and respectfully how to do it. Now, baby led weaning, I have a video posted about this. Baby led weaning is, is okay too. It's an entirely different genre where uh, babies are, or people that are, that are rabid followers of this. Um, they, they put the kid in the high chair and they go, here's your food. And they just give them some stuff that the family's going to need. Here's your broccoli. Here's this, here's this. Go to town, right? And so with this, you don't spoon feed them in the strictest way. You don't spoon, spoon feed them at all. And then they figure out how to eat. Okay, and there's cute videos of this and, and they learn how to do it and it's a no-brainer. Some parents, it works fine. Some of the problems are the food can be salted if it's table food from family. So if you, if you already made broccoli and you put butter and salt on it and you give it to the kid, then you're, you're missing how to help them with their taste preferences. So you have to at least set aside your family food so it's not too salty or, or um, unhealthy before they consume it. So they can learn to do that. Um, so what a lot of people do is a hybrid, which is what they do is they start at spoon feeding, but then they give kids, you know, they you give them a couple spoons and then oh, here's a sweet potato going to town. And so the kids learn to do both. And I don't feel like there's a, a strong reason to pick one or the other according to the literature, as long as the kid's getting lots of experiences with food and they're eating, right? And so, you know, we worry about their iron status and we want to make sure they're getting iron rich foods. One of the reasons to feed uh, spoon feed is to get those iron rich cereals in. So that's one of the arguments. If you, if you just baby let, do baby load winning, they can't use a spoon. There's no way they're going to get a cereal in their mouth because they're just going to get in their hair. Okay, so that's, that's all about the feeding issues. So then um, next is uh, foodborne illnesses or food safety. And there's a lot of issues of food safety, but I'm just going to pick on a couple here that are important. Um, one is avoiding foodborne illness and with kids it's really important because uh, if they become very sick they can become dehydrated so if a child gets dysentery or diarrhea and they lose a lot of fluids then, then medical consultation matters um, there's cases where kids get this and they need you know we break the rule about water if they're dehydrated and so a lot of times there's products called Pedialyte and other things that can help hydrate them um, so that the Pedialyte is basically a you know a, a baby version of Gatorade without the green color in it right so it's got uh, uh, minerals maybe a little bit of glucose in it just enough to kind of help replenish them and keep them hydrated and make it tasty because if if you're sick you don't always want to consume anything so so there's ways of getting around this, but what you want to do is try to avoid foodborne illness in the first place, and of course, of course, avoid choking. Uh, Kristen, are there any chats so far I need to stop for? Nope, so far so good. All right, all right. So let's look at the foodborne illness issue. Um, don't 
choose the unpasteurized and pasteurized products, even if you live on a raw milk farm and it's the best, um, you know, best milk you've ever had in your life. Uh, we regulate things like raw milk uh, because it can have tuberculosis in it, and, uh, and it's only regulated if it's marketed across the state. So, for example, if California produced uh, this product and Texas wanted to import it, we, you know, you can't send the unpasteurized milk across state lines. But within a state, I believe it's still legal to do this. So don't go for raw milk, even if you like it and it's normal because of, there's a couple of things. One is, is tuberculosis and another one is listeria. I'm going to spell this out. L-I-S-T-E-R-A. T T-E-R-I-A. Kristen, you can type it in the chat. Thank you. Okay, listeria. It's L-I-S-T-E-R-A. Uh, yeah, I know how to spell it. I can't do it in front of people on, you know, on camera and stuff. I mean, we just write, type it so that they read it. But so, um, so what we don't want to do is pass foodborne illnesses, and they can be very scary for, for families and pregnancy as well. So we don't want to consume these products during pregnancy and also during, uh, with infants and toddlers. So don't eat raw stuff. Okay, and then, uh, and then there's bacterial contamination. You've learned all of this in your previous classes with Ms. Brasfield. You know, follow all the rules uh, with respect to handling products that can get, grow bacteria. Um, but in the next slide, we'll show you have to be a little more careful with infant feeding. And the final one, um, I don't know, put it in red, put stars around it, you know, darn it. Um, put a star around this, this dipper of honey Honey is a sweetener that should never be offered to an infant before the age of one because there may be spores in honey that are harmless, like if you consume them, they're harmless to an adult, but an infant because of the different pH and anoxic uh, uh, milieu of their uh, gastrointestinal tract, the spores may sporulate and produce the botulism organism, Clostridium botulinum, that it would then produce the toxin and they can die from it. So honey, in, in generations before people would dip pacifiers in you know, sugar water, bourbon, <laughs> whatever they want to do to try to get kids to be quiet, honey, other things, this is a completely inappropriate thing to do. Okay, so, and, and I, I don't know if I brought this up really earlier, but I'll do it now. So. So the rule for honey is pretty absolute. However, if there is a baked good or something that has honey in it, or I hate to use this example, the honey nut Cheerios. Okay, honey nut Cheerios probably have a minuscule amount of honey in them and it's been cooked and that's been a dried cooked product. And so that honey is not very likely to have botulism spores in it that are gonna cause this problem. So cooked, is a little bit different than raw or straight honey. So, but the, the best plan here is just don't do it. Just stay away from any honey products uh, during the first year. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Dr. Chrishell, I have a question. Yeah. So is there any, with, with there, so say after the, the one year, because I, I, I completely understand the reason why you wouldn't want to have it for someone yet less than one year old. But is there anything about the, like the sweetness or the sugar content of honey that would still make it a less favorable food overall? Or is it because it's a specifically produced, you know, product that's natural in a sense, that sugar doesn't equate to added sugars? No, I, I love that question. So here's the deal with the American Heart Association guidelines and no sugar till age two. Um, actually sweetened items, regardless of the source, shouldn't be given to kids till age two. So that's very true. Um, so, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't do that. Of course, the problem is, is when you work with the, the um, people in the wild, they feed their kids all kinds of things. So one of the things we have to do is make these rules like no honey before age one. And then you can also, if you're, let's say you're giving a, a lecture in the community or writing an article about this, you can also say, for that matter, corn sweetener, sugar, and all these and you see concentrated juices, all these things should not be offered either. But honey has that additional problem of 
of potentially causing botulism? So great question because you put it into context. So yeah, don't, no. Well, the same thing I mentioned bourbon on the pacifier, that, that's not a good idea either, right? Um, I just mentioned it because sometimes parents or, or historically parents have done those types of things, but the answer is absolutely not. Okay, so this, said, this slide is a little more specific to baby food. Notice how cold the refrigerator is. How many of y'all know how cold the refrigerator is? Do y'all know? Yes. All right, somebody knows. Okay, um, I do because I have a relatively, well, it's 10 years old now, but it says the temperature when I open it. It's never quite this cold. It's usually at about 40. Um, older refrigerators, apartment refrigerators, who knows, right? One thing to do if you're, is to buy a little refrigerator thermometer to stick in there, then that way you would know what the temperature is because 32 to 39 is safer than 39, like 42 or 43. You know, if, if uh, infants are at risk and then put items in there that could, you know, been sitting out for a while and then could grow some organisms to cause uh, 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 foodborne illnesses, you just don't want to go there. So safety is the way that you want to go. So, um, so if you make uh, strained fruits and vegetables, however, either you make it or you buy it, don't keep them, once you've opened it, don't keep in the refrigerator long for a couple of days. Now, the rule is different if you actually took that jar, opened it up, took a spoon out, and fed the baby, and then took that baby spoon and stick it back in the jar. If you do that, you have effectively contaminated that jar because there could be bacteria, staph, or something in the baby's mouth that if the food was not handled properly after that, could cause a foodborne illness. Okay, so what you wanna do is never, what you should do is if, let's say you open a new jar or something, spoon some of it out into a clean bowl, put the original jar in the fridge, you may not need to get to it the rest of the day, then it's okay because it not has, has not been contaminated with this baby spit, okay? Then feed the baby, and if they want more, pour more in there. So that's how you handle that. But if you do have a jar and, and uh, take baby food out and feed it to baby, then the jar is contaminated after that feeding. Okay, not right during it, but as soon as the feeding's over, you need to throw it away. And fruits and vegetables are safer than strained meats. Um, strained meats because of the high protein content and also eggs are a little more vulnerable or a lot more vulnerable to bacterial contamination. So, you, even though you open it and don't contaminate it with the baby spoon, you don't want to leave the meats in the refrigerator for two or three days and then try it again. So uh, the trick here is kids are little, buy little jars, you know, waste. If you can make it at home, you know, that's an easy thing to do. So anyway. All right, if it's a mixture, then you need to be conservative as well. Okay, so this talks about not using the spoon in the baby's mouth. And also, um, if there's leftover, for, if there's a bottle and there's leftover formula or breast milk in the bottle, that's done. You're, you throw it out, okay? Don't leave it at room temperature for an hour and then give it, see if they want it after that because that's enough time, one to two hours, you know the rules, but they could start growing up uh, pathogens. Okay, so the next kind of concept here is to preventing choking. Um, so uh, you want the child in a high chair, uh, they need to be supervised, you don't leave the room, they can choke on things, you need to cut them up. Grapes, nuts, peanuts, popcorn, hard candy, carrots, hot dogs, meatballs, any kind of puffs, which I don't even con consider to be food. These things should all be cut and, and, and nuts are you know, not consumable by little kids. So if you wanna give them peanuts, peanut butter and stuff like that, you would wanna get a, a, like a, perhaps a, a spread and spread a little thin layer on toast and even then then cut the toast up so that there's not chokeable pieces of it. Peanut butter can be a real choking hazard because it stops, uh, it, stops it, it, it can stop kids from being able to like breathe and clear the mouth. So all these things you need to be careful. Even some blueberries you need to cut in fourths because they're so big. So anything that you can, that could fit in the esophagus and get plugged and then go in the trachea and get plugged you need to be careful about. Okay. So um, 
Uh, the last thing is issues with toddlers. Um, hopefully, with healthcare, you learn about pediatricians, what they, what, what they say to do. Um, so as soon as a child develops a tooth, they should, you should brush that tooth, that one single tooth. Get a little tiny baby toothbrush and you don't use fluoride on it. You just brush it and you start them. They know what's going on. They learn, they watch you. You can brush your teeth and then you get the little nubby tooth brush and rub their, brush their tooth. And then from then on, that's just part of their life. So let's say I brush my teeth with my parents. I do it every morning, every night, or, or however you set up to do it. So um, dental caries can be a real problem. And um, some babies that are put to bed with a bottle, you're never supposed to put them to bed with a bottle because they can choke. But also if you put them to bed with a bottle on their back, then the milk will, will uh, uh, pool around their teeth and, and help grow the streptococcus mutans, which is, you know, can help create uh, cavities. So um, ba basically don't, don't put them to sleep with a bottle. Um, and then having kids eat all day can be a problem. So set snacks and mealtimes is beneficial for appetite control and also to protect your teeth. All right, fluoride we've talked about a little bit. Um, you know, uh, we want enough fluoride in the water to help prevent the development of dental caries, but not so much that it causes fluorosis. So that's something to, to check on your local water supply. Okay, so the final, I did this. Okay, the final slide has to do with two issues with kids, um, uh, two additional issues. One is uh, constipation, another one is toddler diarrhea. So constipation is something kids do stool holding. And what they'll do is instead of going to the bathroom, they'll hold it, and if they hold it, then, then the water gets subtracted from it. And so then it's not as soft as it would have been. And so then it's harder for them to eliminate. And then that becomes a self-fulfilling process because when they go to try to go, it hurts because they're trying to pass a hard stool instead of a soft stool. So then they get scared because it hurts and they'll hold it some more. And so then you, you develop this circuitous problem and it's really common among parents to, to have to deal with this with their kids. Is psychologically, there's a lot involved in learning how to eat uh, food, process it, figure out when you need to go to the bathroom, let it let it happen, and you know they go from diapers to potty training, right? So there's a lot of uh, cognitive function involved in these things. So, um, so I did not do that. Okay, so um, still holding is a problem. A lot of parents. This usually starts when they eat food. So sometimes kids are fine, and then six months you give them those first bites of carrots and then they don't go anymore. A lot of kids do this. So parents freak out. So one thing to do is let it go for a while, see if you can get them to drink more water, see if, if it works itself out. Their bowel habits may change, but they not, may not be negative. But some kids do have a real problem and they won't go and they have to go at some point. So you, know, you sure, surely don't wanna give them a laxative that's painful. Um, and so pediatricians are, pretty much um, recommending you try different juices. And then if that doesn't work, you know, and then all our sweet tooth stuff goes out the window, right? And you go, no sweets. And then you're like, here's some apple juice, right? So apple juice is actually constipating. But sometimes people offer juices for this, like prune juice. But another solution here, and this is in the literature pretty well, is uh, there's a product called Miralax that you can find in uh, all the drug stores, and there's also you know off-label brands of this too, Pure Lax or something like that. It's a white powder, and you you take the white powder. It's in a plastic bottle, you know, container, and you add it to a fluid. Let's say you have a cup, four ounces of a fluid. Try milk if the kid's over one, or um, whatever you can try, and add that to it. See if you can get it to dissolve, and see if it'll take it. Now. With adults, they can take this product. You can take a cap full of Miralax and pour it in your hot coffee and you'll never taste it. It dissolves and it's not, you can't tell it's there. With kids, they're not drinking hot beverages. So it, whatever they're drinking that's a cool beverage, this product is gonna be a little grainy. And so some of them will reject their food and you have trouble getting this into them. Having said this, why this is such a good product and there's so much literature on it is what it does is this white powder that should go away in a warm, in a, in a, in a, uh, warm fluid and um, 
what happens is it stays in the GI tract, it's inert, but what it does is it pulls in water. So if, if a, a child has been stool holding and their stool's really mean and hard and hard to pass, with daily use of this product, the stool gets softer and then it's easier to pass and then you can get past this stool holding issue. Does anybody have a question about this? I know in nutrition, we always talk about pooping all the time. You've had Miss, Miss uh, Brasfield's class and, and, and she's all about the poop, but, but the, it's just part of what goes in, what comes out. Are there any questions about this? We haven't had any questions yet about constipation or diarrhea, but we did have a couple questions about um, the cavities or the, the teeth slide. Okay, let, let me ask first, are there any questions about this? And then I'll go to that. Any constipation questions or does that make sense to y'all? All right, so go to the dental care questions. I just had a question. Um, whenever you say eat crunchy foods, is it eating crunchy foods to avoid um, dental caries or eating crunchy foods uh, causes dental caries? No, you know what? That's what I, when I was reading this, I thought I left that comment out. Usually what crunchy foods do is it helps uh, like an apple is better than applesauce. An apple is more likely to be abrasive and might pull off stuff, whereas applesauce may be more likely to pull around. So that's, that's all I had to say about that. Thanks, that's a good question. And then there was another question too, does drinking cow's milk before the age of one also attribute to dental uh, caries as well as obesity? Uh, not more than anything else. Okay, 